Okay, so in a previous video, we looked at the bridge converter uh, driving a resistive load, which is essentially the simplest case. But in this video, we're going to look at a bit more practical of a case, which is the bridge converter with a non-unity power factor load. Now, in most cases in power electronics, that means inductive, because most of the loads that we drive in power electronics are usually inductive. You can also see capacitive loads, but I mean, we're only going to focus on this, and you can you can apply these principles to any type of uh, non-unity power factor load um, if necessary. But essentially what we have is we have the exact same bridge converter as we had in the previous case, but we've also added an inductor here. Okay, and so we see the voltage across the, or the voltage of the, I guess, of the AC terminals is VA, what we're calling it in this case, and we have IA as well. And so uh, if we look at the waveforms, I'm going to cheat for a second because just to maintain uh, sort of the accuracy of the waveforms, we're going to uh, copy and paste pre-drawn waveforms here. Now, you see that VA is a um, is a three-level waveform, um, so this is sort of a tri-state operation. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, I'll link the uh, the video to the bridge converter where we looked at the simple case, where we showed how you can actually generate a waveform like this three-level case uh, with this type of converter. Um, but essentially what we have is we have a three-level operation here, and we see that the current is sinusoidal. Now you might be wondering how this is possible. Uh, so there's a bit of a uh, there's a bit of an uh, assumption that we're making here. So the assumption is this. If we can ensure that L over R is greater than pi over omega, then we can say that uh, the third harmonic of the current IA is approximately 10% of the fundamental. So we can neglect it is basically what we're trying to say. So if we ensure that this is true, then we can say that IA, well, we can write it as a sort of time varying function, I guess this is approximately equal to, we can say IA1, which is the amplitude of the fundamental component, and we'll say sine omega t minus theta. And now theta is obviously this angle, uh, the, 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 the phase shift between this delta and this or this, I guess, well, defined relative to zero, sorry, not the delta. So relative to zero crossing, this crosses zero at uh, theta instead of crossing it at zero where it should have, right? So omega t minus theta, which is what's, uh, which is what's being shown in this waveform. And we also see that there's, uh, this is clearly indicating that you're approximating Ia by its fundamental component, right? So we, can, we might even be able to, I guess, technically, you can probably call this Ia1. Right, but we're going to say that the entire current is IA, so maybe that's not so accurate. In any case, we can define theta, or we can say that theta is expressed as the inverse tangent of omega L over R, right? And so this shows that the uh, L over R, uh, or omega L over R, sort of uh, governs how much of a phase shift there will be between uh, uh, or I guess, yeah, between the voltage and the current is essentially what we're looking at in this case. We can also say that, uh, we can also say that, th and this is a useful sort of analysis technique, so maybe we can spend a couple of minutes on this. Uh, so if we were to imagine for a second, the entire converter AC terminals, let's model that as a voltage source, right? So ignore the rest, ignore all the switching, ignore all that kind of stuff. For now, all we're going to do is we're going to care about the voltage that is applied to this load, right? And so that we can model whatever that voltage is by VA. And then we can say that uh, we have obviously we have an RL load. And so this is essentially what it looks like, right? If we were to model just the voltage that is applied to the load. And if this is the case, then we have that here we have IA, and obviously we have R. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as J omega L. Now, the reason this is a useful technique, and what I'm doing here is essentially I'm creating a simplified model of the circuit, and what you can do here is you can analyze the circuit for different harmonics now. For instance, if I only want to consider the first harmonic, then you would have, this would be the circuit you have. But if for some reason I want to analyze, let's say, the third harmonic, I mean, we don't have the third harmonic in this case, which we, because of this assumption that we have at the top, but if we did, we might look at the third harmonic like this. So the resistor stays the same, but because the inductor impedance depends on the uh, frequency, this would be J, let's say, 3 omega L, right? So the impedance is different. And then you would also have this voltage would also have to be different. So if this is VA1, this might be VA3, 
and then this would have to be i a three, right? And so this is a simplified uh, circuit, but we can use it to analyze all of the different harmonics. In this case, we're saying that we don't have any of the higher order harmonics, and we're going to neglect them for this analysis. But again, this analysis holds true for all of them anyways. So we can say then that I A1, I A1, which is the amplitude of this uh, I A, right? So this, this I A that I've drawn here in green on this circuit, I A1 is going to equal V A1. And maybe we can rewrite this probably, it's probably more accurate to rewrite this as the amplitude since we're considering amplitudes. Uh, so let's say V A1, and then we can call this I A1 since we're considering the individual harmonics. So let's call that I A1. And so this is going to be V A1 over the total magnitude of this impedance is R squared plus omega L squared under the root. And so that's how we define uh, the amplitude, or that's how the amplitude uh, is modeled in this case. Okay, now we can do the same thing with V A1. And we can do that using a sort of, uh, using the Fourier uh, expansion, I guess. And so we have V A1 can be defined as, as the following. So uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Fourier series and the Fourier transform at this point. And if you're not, then that's definitely beyond the scope of what we're covering. And you probably won't have to do much of this analysis or much Fourier analysis in a power electronics course, but it's still important that you understand what it is, what it is that we're doing. So if you apply this type of, if you apply this integral here, you'll see that this is four VDC over pi, and you have a cos delta here. Okay, now essentially what this is, is if you do a Fourier expansion of, of, of a square wave, you'll see that you get this coefficient for the fundamental, right? So it's four over pi essentially is, is what you get for the fundamental. But because this, this is a, a VDC and it's not normalized to one, you end up getting four over pi times VDC, right? And then the cos delta comes in because you have this, you have this type of waveform. It's not a perfect, uh, it's not a normal square wave, essentially. It's a three level wave. Right. So now, if we def uh, if we sort of express the average power, or if we want to find the average power delivered to the resistor, we can say that P is equal to I A one R M S times V A one R M S. Maybe put a comma there. Looks a little bit better. And then we can say this is cos theta. So this is the power factor, cos theta, right? And so we can say that this is equal to eight V D C squared divided by pi squared omega L squared plus R squared. And this is cos squared delta cos theta. And this is the power that is delivered to the load, uh, well, the resistive part, right? Because that's where the average power would go. So we see that the dependence of the power is very clearly on, uh, or well, the power clearly depends on delta in a reactive load, right? So this delta makes a difference right? Uh, and it also depends on cos theta. So we saw in the previous case that yes, delta also had an impact. I don't, I don't know if I'm not sure, I can't remember if we calculated the, the power in the previous video, but uh, we did have the fact that delta was present in the voltage and the current, and, or the voltage at least. And if it's in the voltage, it's also in the current. And if it's in the voltage and the current, then it's also in the power. But in this case, we're seeing there's an added theta term. And this theta term was not here in the previous case. So this theta has to do with the fact that these two are not completely in phase. And there, there will inevitably be some phase shift between them. So to account for that, we include this power factor. Now, if the power factor is one, right, that means cos uh, theta ends up being one. And so you can completely ignore that, which is goes back to the case that we had in the previous video. But in the general case, we have a non-unity power factor, which is what we're looking at. So in a passive load, which is, this is a passive load because there's no active components here. In a passive load, uh, the power factor is fixed and we can control the power only by varying delta or VDC, right? So in the previous video, we said that if you had, a, if you had some way of controlling VDC here, then you could control the voltage that is applied to the load. And we said that you can probably do that with some type of DC-DC converter and that we're not gonna look at that because it's a relatively straightforward uh, task. So we see that the only other option we have here is that we can play around with delta, right? So we see that if we want to control the amount of power that's delivered to this load, uh, we can all control theta because this is a passive load. And what that means is once you have your inductor and you have your resistor, you can't control 
the inductance and the resistance of those components. So what you end up having to do is, if you want to play with the power that you're sending, or you want to control the power, you want to increase or decrease, you're basically limited to delta in this configuration. Again, you could change VDC, but we're not looking at that case. We're looking at if I have just this thing as a standalone. Okay. Now, if that's the case, then you see that there's obviously a limit to how much power you can uh, transfer, and you can see that you you can also understand how the power sort of varies in the, in, in the two cases. But that's the case for a, in, in a, a passive load. We'll see in another video uh, how when this is an active load or there's a sort of voltage source here, some type of voltage source. It can be like another converter. It can be it can be like a, a component of a, like a motor's EMF or something. We'll see that once there's another source here, or there are active components in the load. We'll see that uh, that that gives us another control handle on how we can uh, sort of regulate or control the power that's being transferred. So in this video, what we did was what we looked at a non-unity power factor case. Uh, so non-unity power factor load. We looked at the waveforms and we saw that there is going to be some phase shift between the voltage and the current because there is a reactive load. And we also went through and we modeled that. We said that if this condition holds true, then we can model the entire current by its fundamental component because we say that the third component is roughly 10%. And that you can find out by doing like a Fourier analysis and then comparing everything and figuring that out that way. Uh, but this is just like a, one of those things, like just, just, just believe me, it's true. Um, and then obviously everything after the third harmonic will decrease uh, in orders of magnitude as, as it goes on. Uh, so you don't need to care, you don't really care about those. So if the, thir the third harmonic is usually the highest, since the third one is 10%, we expect the rest of them to be negligible. Um, and then so we can define everything in this way. And so at the end of it all, we see that the power here uh, depends on a bunch of different things. Obviously it depends on VDC, it depends on the load, but the more important thing is that it depends on delta. And we see that here we're kind of limited as to what we can do with delta because delta can only vary between certain values. And like I said in another video, what we'll do is we'll look at how to deal with the power transfer in the case of an active load. All right, so I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Like and subscribe to support the channel, and we'll see you in the next one.